We have a new hour record champion, Matthias Brendla of IAM Cycling. And yes, I realize it's supposed to be yam, but I refuse to say that because this is a yam. The Austrian picked up pretty high gear, but managed to overcome late fatigue and an incessant air horn to put a few hundred meters into the mark set by almost twice his age, Jens Vogt. So the big question now is, who's up next? Like, seriously, because the other off-season traffic drivers are really... Yeah. Armstrong talking to Cirque again, maybe. Half-baked cycling news translations of completely unbaked Pantani stories from the Italian media. I would never stoop to such inane depths to draw eyeballs. And now, several seconds of looking at a cute dog. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'd love to sit here and fillet stories like the Lance Armstrong-inspired facial polygraph test, but why cook leftovers when you got Roman Kreuziger doling out fresh chuck? If you'll recall from August, Kreuziger first attributed his abnormal biopassport values to extreme dehydration, which, it should be noted, did not work for Jonathan Tiernan Locke. When the Czech Federation cleared him, they unfortunately published their decision in a rosterized PDF, which means I can't auto-translate it. But it appears from this comment at Inner Ring that at that hearing, the notion of hypothyroidism was introduced. That condition sounds like it'd be implausible to ride with, but Leonardo Bertagnoli managed it for a few years as a pro, uh, at least before going to Michele Ferrari to treat it with doping. But as far as I can tell, Alec that his samples were mishandled is a new defense entirely for the Czech rider. All this kind of reminds me of Tyler Hamilton, first talking about a surgical intervention before landing on a vanishing twin. Seriously, anyone want to take odds on Tinkoff throwing a text messaging extortionist into the ring? This week's t-shirt donor is Castelli, maker of delicious scorpion-clad apparel. They were actually pretty relaxed about brand talking points, nudging me instead towards their sponsorship of the increasingly legit MTN Kubeka squad, knocking on the apparently still open door of the World Tour with acquisitions like Edvald Bosenhagen, Tyler Farah, and Serge Powells, who, curiously enough, was prevented from contesting a Giro stage in 2009 by his team director, only to have the win handed down to him when the aforementioned Bertagnoli's results were invalidated. I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up. Castelli's suggestion was actually kind of nice, because I never really know how to handle this transfer sponsorship game of musical chairs. Like, can I talk about Specialized Lululemon joining MTN Kubeka on Cervelo's next season, when both Specialized and Lululemon are following Evelyn Stevens to Bulls Dolmans? Which I think will still be called Bulls Dolmans despite the new sponsorships. It's confusing. Conus Helen Wyman wrote a Cycling News Diary entry reminding everyone that this Saturday's Koppenberg Cross will offer equal prize money to men's and women's fields, thanks to 2020 Cycles, a U.S. bike shop. Apparently, some people found this investment strange. Like, to hear Cycling News commenters tell it, cyclists had been marathon racing around France all by themselves attracting eyeballs until Henri de Grange decided to fund the Tour de France. These guys must be the dudes posting Craigslist ads as the business side of a startup, just looking for a developer to build it for them. Anyway, I don't find it odd that an American business would step up to fund this European event. I mean, if I were a broadcaster, I'd probably be like, LOL, how will American audiences even see it? But as someone who lives in the real world, 2020 Cycling's investment bought them coverage in every cycling publication from Boulder to New South Wales to Antwerp, and probably for less money than an ad buy at any single one of those places would have been. Plus, you know, ad blocking software doesn't block article text so people can actually read it and engage with it. Then there's, you know, the brand association and goodwill. But no, internet commenter, please. Share more of your cost-benefit analyses with me. Wyman also notes that she's glad she doesn't have to deal with the incredibly complex spider's web of road racing, which is something that gets overlooked in a lot of discussions about the sport. Another Cycling News article recently talked about the UCI World Tour as if it were a league, but it's not. It's a series of events owned by a variety of different organizations, all of whom independently negotiate sponsorship and TV rights. Not exactly the best environment for cooperation. In fact, since World War II, at least four other season-long series have risen and fallen. This is in stark contrast to Cyclocross, where the organizer-driven Super Prestige and GVA B-Post series have been running since the early and mid-80s, running pretty darn successfully to hear Super Prestige founder Etienne Hevart tell it. So maybe the sport would be better off with the UCI simply holding its position as a governing body, setting regulations for teams and events, like the hour record, and leaving organizers, teams, or maybe even the sponsors themselves to create the league structure around the overall season. I'm Cosmo Catalano, and that was The Week in Bike.